Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lucy McGuire, and I am the Business Development Officer for Aero Title Services. Thank you guys for being here today. If I'm talking a little wonky or you see that my face is like moving funny, it's because um, I did just get a tooth extracted this morning. So bad um, timing on my account. Don't worry, I'm not in pain. It's still numb. So, um, But thank you guys for being here. Uh, we have Kathy Braid, who is with Old Republic Title, and they are our underwriter um, here at Arrow Title Services. Um, we're very happy to have them be a part of it. Kathy is amazing and very knowledgeable in um, what she does as um, a teacher, so we're happy to have her here with us. Um, a little bit about myself is I'm actually born and raised here in Jensen Beach, so I am a local here to the local area, and um, I've absolutely loved being in the real estate industry here in the last few years and working for Aero Title, um, growing their brand. Aero Title has been around since 2017, but Michelle Chart, our owner and title agent, has been in the industry for nearly 30 years locally and has a plethora of information and knowledge. She wanted to take all of the best pieces of the title company that she worked, worked for, the multitude of companies that she worked for in the past, and she wanted to take that to all the best pieces to create Aero. And um, we have done very well. Um, our whole goal is just to communicate as best as possible we can with, with our clients. And um, we, we really just try to help you guys in any way, shape or form. So my role, I've helped a lot of my agents and clients um, with their social media. Um, even if you're not my client, I'm happy to help you uh, to get to your level of social media. I have delved a lot into social media. If you guys are friends with me on Facebook, I know uh, there's quite a few familiar faces in here. Um, I have, you know, hosted YouTube, I have a YouTube channel, we have a, um, a Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, we do it all. Uh, we started our YouTube channel during, during COVID, and it's been very, um, very lucrative for us in a lot of ways, and I think that every agent should be utilizing those aspects of social media, and there are so many positive aspects that that could add to your business, so one of the aspects that we've actually added though during COVID that I want to briefly mention um, before we get started is that we actually started doing a market update Monday every week with local realtors. And that's a live video that streams live to YouTube and um, Facebook at the same time. And we reach about between 700 and 1000 people on each video each week. So it's a great opportunity for you and to get your face in front of these people, as well as promote yourself and your properties. Um, we also have a Thursday's top tips in real estate. And if you guys ever want any more information on that, or you want to watch the replays of some of those videos to get an idea of what we do, um, that is on our YouTube channel, Aero Title Services, which I will put the link in um, the chat box for you guys. But you guys are always welcome to come on. If you want to be a part of that, just send me an email, which I'll also put my information in the chat for you guys. I would love to have you guys. Um, but enough about that. Uh, this uh, video right here in this class will actually be, um, we are recording right now, and we will be posting this to our YouTube channel so that you guys can utilize this and rewatch it. And um, if you miss anything along the way, or for some reason you have to leave five minutes early, then you will uh, get to utilize that video. So I will send all of that out in an email later. But thank you guys for being here today. And I want to pass the floor to Kathy. Thank you so much, Kathy, for doing these classes for us. And um, I'm excited to talk about today's topic, which is boundary lines. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. Thanks everyone for being here. And I will send the presentation to Lucy after the meeting. And then when she sends everything, she can attach that as well. So if you watch the video again, you'll be able to see it. So right now I'm going to share my screen. Oh, and as well as I'm going to mute um, everyone right now, minus Kathy. Uh, Kathy, I might mute you for a second, um, okay. but then just unmute yourself. And then if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to, you can you can unmute yourself or if you just wanna put it in the chat, I will moderate the chat and you guys can get your questions to Kathy and we'll, I'll stop her and we'll go over your questions. So don't be afraid to ask questions. We are here to help you guys today. Oh, Kathy, you're still muted. Go ahead, unmute yourself. There you go. Um, you can see my screen, correct? Yes. Okay. And, oh, go ahead. And I'm sorry, I, one last thing. We actually have Regina Carner here with Carner Surveying. And um, I had a 
an, an agent ask a specific question about surveys that went above and beyond what I would know. So I wanted to invite her on. She is here on the call with us today. So if you guys have any questions again, um, you know, if for some reason we are unable to uh, answer that for you, we have Regina and all of her amazing expertise with us here today. And we are very thankful for her being here. So thank you, Regina, for being here. <laughs> Okay, and Regina, if you want to um, contribute as we go along, feel free. Okay, so any knowledge that we can share, and you are muted, so you can uh, unmute yourself when you want to, to to speak, or just unmute yourself through the whole thing. And um, anytime you want to share, feel free. So today, as Lucy said, we're going to be talking about boundary lines, how the survey relates to your transaction. We'll go over the paragraphs in the contract that relate to the survey so that you're familiar with those as well. So a survey is an orderly process that the surveyor uses to determine the size, the shape, and the legal um, description of that parcel of land. So a survey, let me just hear, is as you've seen them, I'm sure, is a sketch or a map of a piece of land showing the legal description, the property boundary lines, and any physical features any existing improvements, easements which affect the property, whether they be recorded or unrecorded, any encroachments onto or from neighboring or adjoining properties, restricted use areas that possibly the association may have, a management company has, um, a drainage district, maybe they would have an easement actually. Um, there may be just restricted use areas, so it will show that. Commercial property surveys sometimes include zoning boundaries as well as easements and locally owned throughways. Vacant land surveys in most cases note the property's boundaries and any easements if they are recorded or um, otherwise or unrecorded. Access rights may also be reflected on um, vacant land surveys. Why should your client get a survey? Well, the buyer may want to do improvements on the property after the closing, and they need to know where their property line ends. They need to know if the legal description is correct or incorrect, and what the buyer thinks is theirs may not be so. So if the seller has made improvements with no regard to the land, the, the, to a survey, the buyer may not know about those improvements and the buyer may think that a fence is theirs or a wall is theirs um, or they can do whatever they want to do in a certain area and it may be a restricted use area. So it's very good to have that survey in order for them to determine what they can do on the piece of the land that they think is yours, is theirs. Um, the legal description on that warranty deed or the legal description that you as the realtor and I don't mean to, to accuse anyone, we're all busy and we all make mistakes. So the best thing that you can do, I spoke, I'll spoke. i speak about this every time we talk. The best thing that you can do when you go on a listing appointment is print out the current deed and go to the tax records um, or the appraiser's office and print out um, the report there so that you actually have the correct legal description because the current deed that's of record may be incorrect. People transpose numbers, they transpose letters. And of course, when Lucy gets the contract in her office, they're going to do the same thing. But when you go to the um, listing appointment and you tell the seller that, you know, I've taken the liberty to print these, uh, this deed and, um, and the records from the appraiser's office so we make sure we have the correct legal description and you can show them and they'll, they'll know that you're really a professional because you have these things with you. Um, and that way you make sure that the legal description on your contract is correct because the warranty deed doesn't always have the correct deed, um, legal on it and it's not caught. And so there could be a problem. You may need a corrective document that may delay a closing. Um, so it's important to start out with the correct information. As I said before, what the buyer thinks is theirs may not be so. And um, the contract also addresses the survey. So it's important that you understand the contract in relation to your transaction and what the buyer, it's most important what the buyer thinks they're getting is um, may not be what they're actually getting. I have an example. Um, when I was doing uh, closings, when I worked with a title agent before I went with an underwriter, we had a closing that was really 
not good. Um, these uh, sellers were elderly. They didn't really have dementia, but they were very oh, grumpy people. And they did several things. They didn't let the seller, they didn't let the buyer do a walkthrough and the realtor didn't, realtor didn't insist on a walkthrough, which was not a good thing to start out with because there were a lot of problems throughout the whole transaction. The survey came after the, um, while I was at the closing, it was faxed to me because I was not in the location in my office, I was in another location. The buyer quickly looked at it, didn't review it. I didn't review it with them because of other circumstances. And um, the buyer leaves, so they signed the paper, the buyer leaves, goes to the house and they did not do a walkthrough as I said, and the people left the house atrocious. So he was very angry with that. And then he looked at his survey and he realized that there was a masonry wall on the property on the backside of the property that was, um, there was a canal there. And when he looked at his survey, the masonry wall that was there was actually on a Lake Worth drainage easement, meaning that if they had to come and dig that wall up, they can because an easement allows the easement holder to do that, right? We know we have easements in front of our house. If they have to replace wires, they're allowed to dig up your grass. Um, they usually go under your driveway. They don't, you know, destroy your driveway. But if they had to go in there with a big backhoe or whatever, um, they could because they had an easement. So he called and he was livid and he wanted the title agency to remove, take the wall down, pay someone to take the wall down and rebuild it on within uh, off of that easement. And, you know, it really wasn't our fault. And then he went to the realtor and he wanted the realtor um, to remove it and put it, take it off that easement. And he was saying that, you know, his thought was the um, MLS said beautiful masonry wall on property, okay? And technically it was on his property, but it was on the easement. So sometimes you have to be careful what you put in the MLS. I don't know if anything ever came to fruition, but he wanted to just sue someone because he was angry about a lot of other things. And the realtor was also um, not really, you know, the realtor didn't insist on a walkthrough. So that was, that was strike number one. And then the survey was strike number two. So when you go to a property, it's, it's a good idea not to say, wow, that fence is yours, or wow, that beautiful tree is yours, or wow, that nice wall is yours, because you don't know. You don't have a survey. Um, the paragraphs that relate to the contract, paragraph 9D of the contract says, honor before the title evidence de deadline. And uh, if you were there, if you were here when we talked about the survey, the title evidence deadline is 15 days prior to a closing if the buyer is financing and five days prior to the closing if the buyer is paying cash. Um, that the, sell, the buyer can order or can have a survey of the real property surveyed by a registered Florida surveyor. Um, if the seller has a survey cover, covering the real property, a copy shall be furnished to the buyer and closing agent within five days after the effective date. So again, we're going to go back to your listing appointment. When you're at your listing appointment, you can ask the seller if they have a copy of their survey and if they have a prior, if they have their owner's title insurance policy. Those two things are important to get over to Lucy because they assist with the search and it will give you as the listing agent an idea because after we look at this, you can kind of tell you're not an expert, right? And, and in a survey, you're an expert in, in the realtor, um, you know, in the, the business that a realtor attends to, but you'll make sure that you have the right property address and make sure the legal on that survey is correct as well because you'll have your um, records from the tax office. And um, normally the title agent will order the survey because they have what's needed to send to the surveyor. Um, Florida administration code requires that when the title agent orders a survey, they send a copy of the title commitment along with the request for that survey because the surveyor's job is not to look in public records to see what easements, restrictions, et cetera, are on the property. Um, so that's just something new that they, they should be sending that over so that everything is the same. The survey will reflect any type of um, recorded 
easements, restrictions, and any type of unrecorded easements, which uh, would be a prescriptive easement. We're going to talk a little bit about that later. Can I intervene? Sure. Just for one second, as far as the recorded easements, we usually reply, uh, rely on whatever easements are reflected on the record plat. In most cases, the title companies will not necessarily require us to, to review the title commitment unless it is an ALTA survey. Um, if for most uh, standard smaller mortgages that are not necessarily an ALTA survey, they don't. Uh, they, they 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 do not request us to do a research of the title commitment. But right. Just put that out there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the flood elevation. Uh, oh, go ahead. Did Hi, Kathy. Have this is David Driver. I want to jump in there with Regina too. Um, unreported easements on properties. Uh, a surveyor can only do that by the, seeing the potential for an easement. Uh, if it's unrecorded, if you know, they may see a power line on the property or it's going to a new property, those are things that may not be occurred and they get it on the survey. David, you're, um, you're, you were cutting out a little bit there, but um, I think we got the gist of that, but. Did there, was everyone else able to hear that okay? Okay. Okay. Maybe it's just me. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David. Thank you, David and Regina. Yeah. And those unrecorded easements, that can present a problem as well um, because they're not in public record. So it would show up on a survey. Um, David was talking about a power line. I don't know, Regina, if you want to expand on that. It is a well. We've done quite a few uh, surveys where there is power lines not necessarily within a recorded easements. So if you do show the power line, it, it gives you indication that there is a, a, a prescriptive or an unrecorded easement. It could be a pathway. It could be a right. little dirt road that runs through that the neighbor's been using for 25 years. Right. All those are indication of easements that we do have to show. Right, and that can present a problem as well because suppose the new buyer says, you know what, there's nothing in the county. So what happens now if the buyer decides they want to put a fence around that, right? And now you have someone that's been using that little pathway for 10 or 15 years. You know, mm -hmm. I know you can go to school, we could cut through people's yards, right? And it was acceptable at the time, but if somebody moved in and put a fence up, there's nothing, you know, you can do about it. I guess maybe you could go to court for it, I'm not sure, but I think after a certain amount of time, it's just understood that it was okay. But again, technically you're trespassing, I would assume, um, so it can create a problem. That's why it's always good to have a survey to determine what's going on on that property so that you as the homeowner don't get into something after you buy the property. And again, um, a lot of times the agent doesn't order a survey when there's financing the lender is going to require a Florida form nine so a survey has to be ordered in order to issue that with a clear a clear form nine meaning that we're going to take exception to certain things that show on that policy encroachments um, different types of things um, on a cash transaction the buyer doesn't always want a survey because they don't want to spend the money as the realtor never suggest that they don't need it because should there be something where, you know, there was an unscrupulous person of, let's say, I don't like to pick on pool companies, but maybe they put in a pool and maybe a little bit of the pool was on an easement, although there are no wires there, maybe it's a phantom easement. I've seen surveys where it seems like an easement is going through the center of the house, but it's not a real easement. So there are certain things that can happen. It's always good to recommend that they speak with Lucy's office and they will explain to them why they need a survey. If they don't get a survey, they're going to sign a hold harmless saying, hey, if your pool is built on an easement and the survey, the, um, the company never, sorry about that, the company never did a, uh, ask for a survey and then they decide they need to put some wires in there, well, you're in trouble. So again, always think before you recommend something. It, it just makes good sense. 
Paragraph D of the contra contract talks about the flood elevation certif certification. In the past, we used to have to order that separately, but now it's automatically on the survey. If someone purchases a property that's located in a spe special flood hazard area or a coaster, coastal barrier resources act designated area and the lowest floor elevation of the building is um, and or flood rating purposes is below the minimum flood elevation or is ineligible for flood insurance coverage through the national flood program or through private flood insurance, the buyer may terminate the contract by delivering written notice to the seller within blank days after the effective date. So I'm not sure where special flood hazard areas are or these Coastal Barrier Resources Act designated areas are. I know I was up in the Panhandle doing some training and up in the Destin area. Um, there was um, one area there where um, get flood insurance. Regina, are you? I, yeah, no, I was just gonna intervene on one thing. Please be advised that uh, when you uh, um, obtain an elevation certificate, the way how they work, is that it is uh, for the for the building specific. Um, even you may have a larger piece of property and the back of the property is uh, in a flood zone, but in the front where the house is is not. So therefore you would not be required to have an elevation certificate or carry flood insurance if so if, if you wish so. Um, also, please, please, please uh, keep in mind, that if there is a flood hazardous areas just in your backyard, but your concrete patio or the steps leading to a, uh, a dock, a concrete, a concrete walk that is attached to the house, FEMA will require, or rather the insurance writer will require you to have an elevation certificate because anything that connects to the house is considered uh, putting the rest of the structure into the um, hazardous area. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks Regina. Um, and I just wanna make one point though, when you're talking with your um, clients as well, is that all of Florida is in a flood zone. It's just dependent on how, um, how much the, the risk is that you are, like how bad your flood zone is. So make sure that you're aware of that, but that's a whole insurance side of things because Regina was just talking about the flood zone portion of the um, property. So thank you, Regina. Appreciate you. Thank you. you. No problem. Thank you. Yep. And that's why it's so important. Never tell them they don't need a survey because should anything happen, they're going to go back to you and say, you told me I didn't need a survey. And now look, I have this problem. There's really nothing you can do, but it's just not good business. You know, that's, that's, not your area of expertise. I mean, you wouldn't want, um, you know, a gastroenterologist to, to do brain surgery on you, right? You would want a brain surgeon to do it, somebody who really understands that. So it, it's the same kind of thing. Um, paragraph D, uh, 18B, uh, regarding the survey. If the survey discloses encroachments on the real property or improvements located thereon that encroach on setbacks, um, easements, whatever, then the buyer, if the, and if, if the buyer feels that they don't want the house for that reason, they can give written notice to the seller with a copy of that seller. And the seller within five days, but no late five days of receipt of the survey and no later than the closing. If the buyer timely delivers written notice and survey to the seller, such matters, matters identified in the notice and survey shall constitute a title defect. Um, subject to cure ob ob obligations and standards um, A above. If there are any big problems on that survey, believe me, the surveyor is going to notify the title agent or the person who ordered the survey and say, look, we have a big problem here. That's why it's important to order it um, in a timely fashion so that the buyer is in with, within the timeframes Regina, do you have any examples where you have those big problems like that that you would call up the agent, say, or the attorney, or you know, whoever ordered that survey? If a buyer ordered the survey on their own, say, hey, we have a big problem. Do you ever in, um, Ab encounter things like that? Absolutely, and and in a lot of cases, it all has to do with the legal description. 
that a legal description that pops up in a title commitment when we uh, go out in the property, we find that um, all of a sudden we see fences and other usage. Uh, and it turns out that a portion of the property had been deeded away or an easement had been granted uh, for access across the property. Um, or um, uh, they uh, climbed the possible buyer thought they owned up to the water because it's wide open up it. But voila, once you look into it, there is a huge portion in the back that they do not own. And it was not clearly, that information was not clearly available before, before that. So that's why it's, it's important not to um, say that this is yours, this is not yours, um, because you don't really need it until a survey is done. It's very important. Um, this, the survey shows whether the house is within the property boundary lines, whether there are any encroachments on the subject property from neighboring properties, whether there are any improvements. Hang on for one second, please. My husband is on the phone in the other room, other room. I just had to tell him to be quiet. Kind of like children when you work from home, <laughs> be quiet. You have to tell husbands and dogs as well because my dog, she's behaving right now. Um, so it also says, uh, we'll show whether any improvements on the subject property encroach onto neighboring properties, easements, restricted use areas, et cetera to the extent to which any easements or restrictions on the subject property affect the title or the property owner's use of the subject property. Um, it shows whether the legal description matches that on the plat and the appraiser's office and whether there is access to and from a subject property. You have to have access to and from the subject property in order for us to insure it or the property that the um, buyer is purchasing would be landlocked. Someone buys a big piece of property. Um, they want to give it to, oh, somebody else has a dog. I'm happy. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, someone buys a big piece of property and they want to give some uh, portion of it to their children to build a home on, whatever the case may be. However, there's no access to it from a public street. So there would have to be some type of an access easement, road right agreement, something that's there that allows one person to pass over their property to get to the one that's being insured. So you always have, have to have access to and from subject property. Regina, you have anything to say about that? Uh, yes, I do actually. Uh, okay. Also be careful just because somebody says uh, you have a 10 foot easement to get to your property and you can build a road on it. That may not necessarily be so uh, because the county uh, requires a certain width to make it a, uh, an open road, which is usually not less than 30 feet. So if you have less than 30 feet, it will never ever be considered an open road, even, even if you can if, even if you can improve it. And if Dave is on there, he also works with the county, he can probably add on to that. Um, we actually have a question um, and saying, is the surveyor required to know the rules of the town or area of the property, side yard restrictions, setbacks, et cetera, which I would say yes, but go ahead if you have a um, I mean, we, we do look it up. Usually we look it up if we know that somebody is going to do construction. It is a special uh, form we have to submit to the county in order to obtain site, uh, site and front and rear setback restrictions. It gets a little muddy because there's a lot of HOAs out there. And if you have a homeowners association, then those requirements requirements, if more stringent, will supersede those of the county. So we are very hesitant to show the county setback requirements because there might be private requirements by that HOA that are even more stringent. Yeah, absolutely. When HOAs come in, everything gets more complicated. <laughs> and, even the color of your house. I don't know. Am I coming through, Lucy? Because yes, I have a you are now. Yes, thank yes, you. you I just have, I would just want to say, you know, kind of along those lines, as a, as a realtor, don't tell your, your buyers or people like that, that they can split a property if they want to cut a piece off for their family without knowing 
what right. the requirements are of the county code because it could be determined as an illegal lot split and be a lot of trouble. Right. And realistically, again, that's for uh, county attorneys, different people have to get involved in that. It's not just something that you can arbitrarily do. And thanks for bringing that up, Dave, because not, not everybody realizes that, you know? Well, yeah, and Kathy, I deal with it a lot because I'm a county surveyor here in Florida also. Oh, okay. I'm also yeah. a licensed realtor, but I'm also a surveyor. Yeah. Hey, David, I had mentioned earlier and I had wanted your input in that in regards to um, open road requirements, uh, uh, that some properties have uh, maybe an access easement only 10 feet, but in order to do a certain development on a piece of property, it has to be uh, connected to an open road. And I have seen uh, properties uh, ending up to be landlocked, even though they had a uh, 15 foot right away on it, but the county couldn't improve it. So therefore it was considered to be still landlocked, even though there was a right away. Yeah, and there's typically requirements to have a certain amount of frontage on any road right away. I, I, I should say a legal existing road right away before you so can develop the property. So, I, so I, have a, I have a question. So if I buy a piece of property, a large piece of property for me, and I would like to give my children the property, but all around me, the only road to that property is in the front of my property, right? There's nothing, no, no um, public roads on the other three sides. There's only a public road in front of my house. So if I wanted to give um, my children access to, you know, it's, it's five acres. If I wanna give them access to um, a piece of property one acre in, would I be able to do that if there was no other access other than the front of my house? If you're, if you're going to deed them one acre of your land, they mm -hmm. will need access to develop it. Um, and again, you have to be careful because when you have a piece of property, you have to be uh, aware of the fact of whether or not you can split it, split it one time, or if right. you split it, you know, right. Sometimes if you split it more than once, you have to record a plan. Oh, okay. But, so but you, as far as the, you know, go ahead, Regina. But as far as the width of the access easement that you can grant in order for to access that one acre in the back, um, I would advise to not make it any less than 30 feet in order to adhere to any possible uh, county requirements that might be existing as far as access. Yeah, I yeah, no, we require no. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, we okay. require 60 feet of access. Okay. Wow. No, um, no one has ever asked me, but it's good to know. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be now. Thank you, David and Regina. I, we actually have a, um, a question, which will probably be good for um, Kathy and um, Regina to answer. Um, so, Bottom line, they said there can be items that are problems, even if the survey is done. If so, who makes sure that there are no problems, which kind of leads into the next question, which is who is responsible to tell a buyer about HOA setbacks if more, if they're more stringent than the county? I don't know. I mean, yes, they all HOA, all HOA requirements. Um, are of record and they're part uh, and there should appear in the title search. Um, so that in most cases, I would hope that the realtor would provide that information to the purchaser. Um, um, and if, if not, it does appear on the title search and they have um, access to them that way. And it is, you know, we all know that in real estate, it's all about working as a team to get us right. all to the closing table. So, you know, there are times where we get a contract and it's in an HOA and they haven't even filled out an HOA addendum. Um, you know, they haven't even given us any information with that. Um, you know, as a realtor, I would say you, it is, 
just like you're um, knowledgeable in the fact of like what the amenities are of that HOA and such like that. You guys are in the field when it comes to that, but we can work together with both of our knowledges to make sure that everything is being disclosed in the proper way with that HOA community. Um, and every so nobody is, that's the whole point of the whole process to make sure that nobody is getting um, screwed over in the end. That's what a title company is. We are that middle party that makes sure that both parties are taken care of at the end of the day. And the contract also says that the you know the um, buyer should receive the documents and review the documents. Yes. You know? So which, again, yeah, which you know hopefully happens. You know, yeah. we um, send it, we send it out, but sometimes it's not getting read. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 You know? So you know, um, technically, they they should review it if they don't if they you know it depends on who's who they have you know who they're working with. Okay. Types of surveys. Um, the boundary survey is the most common type that we see in our business, right? The boundary survey um, is going to show the boundary lines, as we know, and any improvements in that property. Meets and bounds survey is the oldest form of survey, and that's going to um, go describe a parcel of land, and it's measured in distance, angles, and directions. The survey uses the surveyor uses directions and distances from physical monuments to this determine and describe the boundary lines. Monuments can be natural or they can be um, iron posts in the ground. And um, most important, one thing that's most important, there are a lot of things important about um, any legal description. So if you do have a meets and bounds description, it, it should end at the point of beginning. Usually it starts beginning at, and it will, it will, you know, point of beginning. It will always reference that point of beginning and it references, uh, usually references some of the survey as well. And it should end there because if not, you have a gap and it, it should always be closed. And when we're gonna look at a survey and um, you'll see that it's done in degrees, minutes and seconds. And then it gives you the direction that the property, um, that, that that boundary line goes and the distance degrees, minutes, and seconds because the earth is round and we think it's round. And we, we hope it's round because that's how we figure everything out. And um, so that's how that's how le um, meets and bounds descriptions are, are written. We're gonna look at um, a survey later and I'll point that out to you. Condominiums do not require a survey because when the documents are recorded in the county, the survey is included with the documents and each unit is basically the same size. So you don't need a survey for a condominium. A construction survey is prepared during the course of the construction and it shows the progress of the construction. So that may be done in the beginning and then it may be done throughout depending upon if there's a lender involved what they want. A topographical survey is um, locates all surface features on a property. Usually those are done when people are buying large tracts of land to develop um, into um, communities or commercial properties or whatever, so that they know where there are any streams, lakes, hills, valleys, et cetera. And then the survey that, um, the commercial property surveys are the Alta ACSM surveys, and those are much more um, involved, as Regina mentioned earlier. Usually they are for commercial properties and they have zoning requirements on them, parking spaces, et cetera. Um, and it shows uh, the commercial surveys usually show all of the items that are on B2 of the title commitment. Uh, we, have a, we have another question. Thing? Okay. Oh, so um, someone has said uh, no, no HOA, but a town within a county who has their own rules. If a seller did something in the past without a permit, but it violates the town rules, who should catch that? Now I have I have sort of an answer, but Kathy, I'd like for well permits permits are not recorded, all right. So title search only addresses items that are recorded. The agent usually does a municipal lien search. The municipal mm -hmm. lien search would show any open expired permits or code violations. So right. when that lien search comes in. And the contract also addresses that, who's to pay for it, and the de definition of a municipal lien search. So um, some agents just will say to the 
um, realtor, the listing agent, this is what needs to be done. Um, you know, are they going to take care of it as is contract they're purchasing as is. So does the seller have an, an obligation? It depends on what the contract says. If there are additions to that, con if in the additional comments section, the realtor has put, you know, seller shall um, close all open and expired permits and satisfy all code violations, then the seller has to do something. On your regular residential, the seller is, um, you know, it has a section there for permits. It doesn't really say anything about code violations. So again, again, on your listing appointment, if you go and you see that they've turned the garage into a man cave or an office or added a room there, you can ask them if they did that or if they purchased it that way, are they aware of any open expired permits? Um, Maybe there are code violations because maybe they put electric in or plumbing and it doesn't meet those those um, the um, standards. It doesn't meet the code. So again, the title agent is going to order that, but it's it does not affect title and it, yeah. it can be a problem. We had. So, a, oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, go ahead, Kathy. Sorry, I didn't. I thought you were done. No, just real quick. There was an issue in Miami. Lady purchased a house. She's in there and. Uh, you know, a month or so, she calls up Old Republic and says, oh, I have a claim. What's your claim? I got something from the city of Miami or somewhere. And uh, it said that there's, um, you know, $150,000 worth of code violations. You know, that's a claim. No, it's not a title claim. It doesn't affect title. She can turn around and sell that property tomorrow. It's not a defect in title. It's just everybody's worst nightmare. So that's why the title agents order those and then point them out some title agents don't require or don't insist that they're taken care of. And again, if it's not in the contract, if it's an as is contract, it can create an issue. So go ahead, Lucy. So, um, I mean, we insist that it's done in the process, um, but when it comes down to it, again, we are all a team. So we talk, I, I know we talk about that all the time when we're on our live videos and such, but it is so important to have, you know, communication between all parties, right? And I know you guys know as realtors how important communication is. So you guys are the boots on the ground. You guys are the ones going through the house with these um, buyers and stuff like that, checking out these properties. If you ever see something that doesn't seem right or you see that converted garage, we are looking up those open and expired permits um, within the property. So when we are doing it um, through St. Lucie County, we order it through the county, through Martin County, we're able to look through public record, but we are pulling that. Now, we don't know, whatever we pull from that, as well as with the survey, from a survey, we cannot tell, oh, well, they've made this change and it wasn't permanent. If there's no record of permit, then we have no way of saying, okay, they did this without us seeing it. And sometimes a survey isn't gonna show that because the survey doesn't show inside the house or whatever it might be. So just be aware, it's about working together um, through the process. We'll, we are pulling that information. We are making sure again, that both parties involved are not getting taken advantage of, um, but that's, that's the whole point is we are doing the survey to make sure that they, there isn't anything that we're missing from that end. But if it was never recorded, it's never disclosed to us, we as a title company do not assume um, responsibility of that because we, there would be no way for us to know if it was never disclosed to us. And it's not a title issue. And it's not a title issue too, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 you know, no matter what, um, you couldn't put in a claim to the title insurance underwriter and, and sometimes you can't even see it. My son purchased a home. Um, the municipal lien search came in the night, the evening before the closing and there was an open expired permit and it was for some electrical work, uh, something outside. And fortunately the electrician was still in business and they called him and he said, oh, you know, I remember that house and I did not have it inspected, but, and it's not the code anymore. So I can come out there and fix it and I'll have the inspector do it before you're closing, you know, inspector approve it and close the permit out, you know, before you're closing. And that happened because probably the fix wasn't an expensive fix, right? But if the fix had to be a couple of thousand dollars, then there would have been an issue because it's an as is purchase 
and the seller may not have wanted to um, pay for that fix. So again, you know, he wouldn't have to pay for it because it's as is. So it can be kind of sticky. That's why title agents will usually take care of it. Some counties, as Lucy said, you can look up open expired permits. Other counties, you can't. Um, so they either order it from a third party or they do it themselves. But it's always important if you want to make sure that it's taken care of, you can put that with your broker's permission in the additional comments section. Address it somehow that the seller would be responsible for it. But that's something that you would have to speak with your broker about. I, I want to intervene on that, um, uh, on that setback question that was asked just a little while ago, as far as if they if the town in, in another municipality and they had other restrictions as far as setbacks is concerned, when you, most of the time, when you get your standard, what they call a mortgage survey, even, even though it is not a definite type of survey, but everybody refers to them as mortgage survey. It is a, a, a plain boundary survey. We show how far a building is of a property line. If I blatantly see that there is an issue, I will tell the title company, whoa, that looks like it might be in setbacks. You may, may want to check on that. If we do an ALTA survey, we are required to go ahead and pull all the nece necessary setback requirements from the new municipalities, but that does not necessarily get done for mortgage survey. Right, and when we have a setback on the policy, we take exception to that. Right, we're going to right. make sure, except for that setback line. If you're, if you, the prop, you know, if the property encroaches on that setback line. Um, I hope that answers that question. Yes, thank you so much, Regina. And um, I, I believe we've already answered this in what we just said, but I, I don't want to feel that Paul um, thinks we missed his question. He said, "Whose problem is a list of code violations, and who should have to, who should have caught them before closing?" With your Miami case, um, Kathy. Okay, um, there's no way to catch exactly. them closing. The, 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 the contract does say that the seller should notify the buyer in writing if they know of any open, if they know of any permits that were open and you know haven't been taken care of or whatever, um, or work was done on the property with a permit the contract addresses that, but it's the as is contract. So the seller is not obligated to pay anything. That's a negotiation. Yeah. Um, but if you don't have that in the ad additional comments section, then um, it would it would be it could be an issue, right? As far as the code violations, if if I were a realtor, I would probably only because I know this, right? This is my job and I'm aware of these things. If I was just the general public, I wouldn't. But maybe you can suggest that, you know, um, and ask the, the seller, you know, have you had any notices of code violations because they're going to show up and it should be actually addressed and taken care of prior to closing because the buyer may feel, well, wow, if you got notices like this person with, you know, $150,000, $200,000 worth of code violations, they should have been notified somewhere along the line. I think the city or county will notify you if you have a code violation, right? Yeah. Um, so they should know. And by them saying, well, no, I don't know anything, it's only gonna come out and then the buyer may feel, well, what else did they lie about, right? If they lied about that and they knew they had all these code violations, did they lie about anything else? So it puts everybody in a really <laughs> uncomfortable position. So again, listing appointment, ask them. Did you have any work done that, that was not permitted? Especially if you walk in and you see that a room has been redone or the garage has been redone and they say, oh no, I didn't do it, but it still smells like sawdust and it's brand new. You know, that'll give you an idea that, hey, maybe they did it and they're just not, you know, being truthful. Um, so it's really up to the seller to be honest and just the seller know that if, if they have code violations, it's going to come out. And, and let them... Let them know as an agent that it's important that they're honest about that and communication mm -hmm. is very important and make sure that they know to not do anything else during closing, just like we tell people not to purchase a new car or anything right. like that. You know, sometimes or furnish we, their house. Yeah. yeah. 
sometimes these small little things that people don't think about because they're not in this industry every single day. Um, as the realtor, you know, you want to remind them, hey, I know this may be common sense, but I want to just remind you, do not make any, do not any, do any work that could affect closing. Um, just, just being cognizant of that and maybe doing another touch point of a reminder for them so that they don't go out and um, do that. Uh, with a mortgage, isn't it required that the seller correct an open lien, even if it is with an as-is contract? An open lien that's recorded in the county? Yes. Yes, which is why we perform the lien searches. Right, but, right. but a permit or code violation are not recorded in the county, so they're not liens on the property. Title commitment Liens on property are judgments, mortgages, uh, any type of a lien that's recorded in the county that requires a satisfaction for. A permit and code violation, unless they are recorded, a code violation could become possibly, or a building code violation could become an easement, uh, could become, excuse me, could become um, a lien on the property. There are certain things if it if it's lasts a long period of time, I think. But in any event, what we're talking about, they're not recorded in the county. So the only person that may know about it is the seller, because they should have been notified about code violations. And if they had work done and it was permitted, they should always check to make sure that the um, permit has been closed with the county. They can look that up. Most counties have it online. And I, go ahead. Yeah, this is David again. These issues of code violations and uh, liens and things like that, they're not going to show on a survey except for the possibility of maybe a building setback problem. Right. So those are all things that the, the agent, the title company, and everybody needs to get together to take care of. You're not going to see that on a survey. Mm -mm. Nope. Because, it, again, it doesn't affect the property. Right. It, it's not it's not something that would show. Right. You know, a code violation might be a setback that we might determine right. in the in the course of a survey. But, you know, yeah. other things are not going to show up on a survey. Right. OK, some some vocabulary access. That's the right to enter and leave a tract of land, whether it's public or private right of way. Um, bearings and distances tell what directions to go north, south, east or west. And the distances tell how far to go in that direction. Um, a right of way is the right which one has to pass over another's lands, such as a driveway or a walkway. Um, and the, the land cannot be used. Uh, I have the land cannot be used for any other reason. Um, restrictions, it's restricted use areas and areas of property. For example, land dedicated to drainage areas. They might be restricted use areas. Some communities have restricted use areas where um, it's restricted for the uh, community, the association, whatever the case may be. If you put your fence on there, we had that in our neighborhood, people put fences in a restricted use area. And when the code enforcement came around, um, they required the people, the, they notified the board of um, the board of the association and um, told us that we should have those people sign a paper stating that if we needed to uh, ask them to remove the fence that they put in the restricted use area, that they would do so because it was a restricted use area and it is in our documents. So sometimes there's that. Easements is an interest in land owned by another that allows the easement holder specific limited use of the land. Um, again, we're gonna see that when we look at the survey. Encroachment, as I said, it uh, happens when one property owner violates the property rights of his neighbor by building or extending a structure onto the neighbor's property, whether it be intentionally or unintentionally. A survey review, for example, do you send in any encroachments, easements, or restrictions when you look at a property? You don't, right? So that's why it's not good to say um, anything, like that fence is yours, or, you know, yeah, you can do whatever you want in the back or whatever, because you don't know you're, when you're looking at it. Um, do you see a problem here? Does anybody see a problem there, right? A shared driveway, what a mess. Who's going to take care of it? 
who knows where that property ends? You don't know. Um, do either of you want to expand on a shared driveway problem? Surveyors? <laughs> it's, it's uh, we don't to... want to touch that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess. There, there's yep. not a right or wrong answer to a shared driveway because the property line most likely goes towards the middle or so. Or and so, neither that's one the problem. Of, <laughs> neither one probably has an easement and that's when we just show it and voila, there it is. <laughs> yep. Maybe it's a title problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and really, what if, okay, so we're thinking that uh, hopefully the, the property line will go right down the center and everybody has, you know, equal. Well, suppose this guy's property line goes over here or suppose, you know, there's a problem between the people and now they don't want to share the drive anymore. You know, you're going to go to court. It's a mess. Who's going to fix this if it's, if it's on, you know, if the crack started up here and it goes over to this person's property, well, who's going to fix it? You know, if this crack started over here on this guy's property, well, who's going to fix it over here? It's a mess. So when you have a shared driveway, lock your mouth and throw away the key. Don't say anything, right? It's just a <laughs> situation. So there, what problem, what do you see? Yeah, you see a big problem there. So again, and let's say you have a property where the driveway, like, let's say this was the access to, this is the access to this guy's house, right? And then there's a problem because, you know, it looks like maybe these properties have been sold several times. So maybe they have a survey and everything is good. But suppose um, somebody bought a house cash several years ago, they had a shared driveway, they didn't have a survey. And suppose this person's property actually went to here. Just suppose, how would this person get to, to their house, to their driveway, right? They wouldn't have access, full access. They would have to go to court and have a fight about that. So there are so many things. So it's very um, hard. If someone is selling a property with a shared driveway, always ask if that person has a survey or their owner's title insurance policy so that you can, as the listing agent, have that if the selling agent asks to see a survey, just so that there's no problem. That's my suggestion. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a survey. Um, this is one that we had in one of our files. Uh, as I said, access is important. So you can see here that there's access into the property. You have your um, street here, your right away. Uh, we talked about bearings and distances. You'll see them here and they are, it gives you the um, degrees, minutes, and seconds, the direction, and the distance. You have a certification. Surveys are certified to the buyer, the title agency, the underwriter, and if there's a lender, it would be surveyed to the lender. The legal description is going to be on the survey, and that should be the same as the warranty deed. It should be the same as the deed of record. Uh, all the legal descriptions should match. There's a graphic scale on the survey. Legend is going to describe any abbreviations or any um, particular symbols that are on the survey. Directional arrow, it's going to tell you north, south, east, and west, which way the property, um, the directions of how the property is located. Legal notice, legal notes, um, this is important to, to look over. Legal notes will be on there, um, what the surveyor sees. There's your flood zone information is on here. There are surveyor's notes. There should be a surveyor certification. It would have the survey's date, uh, the surveyor's date, the uh, certification date, and the surveyor seal. It used to be that this was a raised seal, but usually now they're electronic seals. And everything is nice and in color now, before it wasn't. And actually most surveys now will um, point out the easements so we're going to look at the property. We're going to start here. And as we go along, we'll see that there are X's here, right? And our legend will tell us that that's a chain link fence. So we're looking and we're seeing that the 
you see your iron posts. So it's giving you the corners where the property boundaries are. This is your boundary line, right? And it ends, you can see that it ends at the point where I began. I'm not, it's not necessarily the beginning. So now we're looking to see if there are any easements. Well, the surveyor has marked it. You'll see these little dashes. And you're seeing that this is a 10 foot utility easement. Usually if you're in a planned unit development, you have these in the front of your house where your driveway is. This is where your utility wires are, right? The person's property ends at the sidewalk. Okay, so anything from the sidewalk out is not theirs. And you'll see it has these little letters, letter A, right? These are items that encroach. It's telling you what those encroachments are, okay? On your 10 foot utility, the driveway is encroaching on that easement and your apron or your return is encroaching into the right of way, right? It's also telling you that the water meter lies in the property, right? So the surveyor has put encroachment notes and it says on the west side of the subject property, brick driveway is encroaching into the 10 foot utility easement and brick um, return is encroaching into the right of way of the Oak Knoll Circle and the water meter lie in the subject property. So the surveyor is giving you an idea of what's there, but the title agent will still review it just to make sure when we look to the back of the property, you'll see that there's another 10 foot utility easement. And he's also giving you a hint as to what's here, CLF, chain link fence. So we're going to see where that chain link fence, fence starts. Well, we can look anywhere. So let's look here. It's right on the property line here, all the way around. So it's not encroaching anywhere but here. See that little X right there? Well, the surveyor is saying, hmm, it seems like this fence it goes with this property because it doesn't encroach anywhere else. So the surveyor is saying that the, um, on the north side of the property, the chain link fence is encroaching into the neighbor's property. So it's not only if something encroaches onto the property that's being insured, it's if something on the property is encroaching into the neighbor's property. So again, it's also saying that that chain link fence here and here is encroaching to this into this easement. So there's really no problems that we see here. We see that it's a one-story house. It has the residence number and the lot and block. The pool isn't any um, isn't encroaching on the easement. The deck isn't encroaching on the easement. So really, there are no real problems on this property. Now, if this pool or if this deck were encroaching onto the easement, I've seen it where a deck, a certain number of feet are encroaching onto the easement, um, that would go to underwriting and underwriting would determine the risk. What is the risk there? Um, if that uh, utility company had to come in and dig up, what is the risk? So they would determine the risk and then we would take exception to it. We're always gonna take exception to any encroachments. So when the person gets their policy, we're gonna insure you except for the driveway and the return that encroach on that easement. Meaning you can't say to us, um, they dug up my driveway, now you have to fix it because we're insuring you except for, just like our homeowner's policies, they're insuring you except for the perils that we really have that cost a lot of money that we pay a lot of money for and they never reimburse us for. Those are the things that um, we don't read because we can't understand those insurance policies sometimes. We're May I touch on the fence? Oh, I'm so sorry. May no, I touch ahead. on the fence for a second? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think it is important to know for the realtors to never ever say that is your fence. We put a big note on our surveys that we do not determine ownership of fence lines because that fence line may have been there for 20 years. Correct. And we don't know no, we don't know who built that fence. So I don't know if it is encroaching onto the next property or if the other property is encroaching onto yours. We will show the location, but I will not tell you that you own that fence because no. I do not know that. Right. And you also may see overhead wires, right? Your utility pole may be in the easement, which is where it should be. 
in the easement, or maybe it's outside of the easement, maybe it's over here, but those overhead wires are actually encroaching onto the proper, over the property, right? Because you own airspace. So um, that will be a, an exception on the policy. Just like the uh, title agent is saying, and the underwriter is saying, I'm going to insure you except for, except, except for that chain link fence, because I don't know whose it is, right? Except for that masonry wall that was on that Lake Worge drainage easement that I spoke about earlier. I'm going to insure you except for that because I don't know, you know, I'm not going to be responsible for that. So again, when you do look at a survey, again, never advise them that, oh, well, you know, that's your fence there because as Regina said, you don't know. Nobody knows, right? Uh, because it could have been put there 20 years ago or the seller could have put it in, yes. And, and they did start it out there. So again, don't ever give them advice on it because we don't know. And that can only get in trouble. And be very careful if you're a realtor and you're trying to read these right. surveys. Um, don't just don't speak on anything that you're right. not completely 100% sure about. Um, we have some agents who will reach out to us and be like, can we get the survey? I want to explain it to my client. And we're like, mm, like, you know, it's, it's something that you want to, and every survey looks different. Like this is every, every server kind of has different right. layouts and different ways in which they look. So you know, you seeing this one survey isn't going to give you a guide and key to seeing every single survey. So I just wanted yeah, to- Yeah, and, and also, you know, it's not your area of expertise as exactly. even sometimes the agent who looks at surveys will send it over to our underwriters to say, hey, how does this look? It doesn't look right to me, right? Because again, none of us are experts. The surveyors are because that's their job. Realtors have a certain expertise and so do title agents. So, you know, you can always, you know, have Lucy look at it. She'll look at it. If the buyer has any questions, she can explain what she sees. That's her job, right? Because that's what she's trained to do. So this is just to give you an idea of what a survey looks like and what's on it. But again, always refer to the professional. It makes you look more professional because we can't know everything about everything. We know um, certain things and we're good at certain things, but if we don't know, it doesn't hurt to say that, you know, I'd rather refer you to someone who can give you a little more information. That's absolutely right. Everybody has to stay in their lane and then we can help each other in everybody else's right. lane. That, we have, we're like, yeah, that makes for a know. seamless closing and that's what you want. Go ahead, Dave, I'm sorry. It's okay, I just have a question for you from the title um, position. Utilities that are contained within the easement, I don't consider those encroachments because they have the right to be there. They have the right to be there, but as the title underwriter, we take exception to that because when we issue the form nine, it says unless um, that the form nine is, is clear, unless expressly accepted on schedule B2 of the policy. So we always take exception to any type of encroachments whether it be a setback line, whether it be the driveway encroaching on that utility easement, um, because the homeowner may think that they can come to us and say, I didn't know that. And they dug that's up. That's something that, you know, I was unaware of. I've been, you know, a licensed surveyor for 30 years in Florida, and I've never called a utility that's located on a survey within an easement an encroachment. So that must be something that gets picked up on the title end. Yep. And the, well, the util the easement is not an encroachment. The driveway is an encroachment onto the easement. Yeah, that's a, that's kind of a sticky wicket because how else do you access your property? Um, I, do know that, I do know that the record plats in Indian River County now do have language that say that the, the lot owners do have the ability to um, construct a driveway in the right of way because obviously part of the driveway is in the road right of way also. Right, right. And that's, that's what they're, that's what they're saying, you know, that they are, um, it's, it's actually an encroachment onto that. So that's interesting. I didn't, I never had heard right. that or seen it before. Mm -hmm. Yep. I can send you some information, Dave, if you want, I can send it to Lucy and she could forward it to you. Just That'd so that. Good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind getting that too. Okay. I will send it to you. Yep. We have it in, uh, 
in our uh, information. So I'll send that to Lucy and then she can forward it on to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No worries. Okay. So what is your role as the agent? You're going to point out the different paragraphs in the contract that uh, refer to the survey uh, to the buyer. Cash buyer suggests they get a survey to protect their investment. Ask the seller if they have a, a survey and their title policy at the listing appointment. And you can send that on over to Lucy when you send the contract. It always helps to have those things right up front and never suggest, again, that a fence, a gazebo, a wall, whatever is on the property, always suggest they get a survey. That's the safest thing. Leave it in the um, hands of the professionals and it will, you will have much better outcome with your closing and it'll be a seamless closing. So that's it for us today. Well, for me today, anyway, did, were there any more questions? Um, I did want to go over the specific question that we had um, in that someone had emailed me ahead of time. So um, Regina can answer to this really quick, just so that um, in the, and I don't see them in this call right now, they must've had to jump off. I know we got a little bit over time here, um, but uh, I want this to be mentioned for the record. So um, Regina, can you discuss what a mean waterline survey is and how it differs from a regular survey for waterfront homes in Martin County was his question. Certainly, a, a mean high water line is considered a jurisdictional line, um, which means uh, your ownership ends, uh, ends at the water and then the state takes over. And that line is considered a mean high water line. A mean high water line is determined by a certain height, by a certain elevation and by the contour that elevation makes. Um, over the past years, for, for, for many, many years, uh, you'll see plats that just are platted to the shoreline. And that's been the accepted way to show a subdivision and lots that own up to the water. Most of your standard normal boundary survey just will indicate a shoreline. But should you do any constructions or, um, um, or determine any setback requirements that have to be adhered to, uh, what is being used is a mean high water line. And that is actually a separate survey. It is called a mean high water line survey. Um, and I, I think that answers the question. Thank you, Regina. Um, and that survey is separate and can cost a little bit more, right? Yes, it can. Absolutely, it can, yes. It, it, that's why it is not a standard item that would appear on a regular mortgage survey. Um, due, due to the fact we do have to contact the state, we have to run that contour alongside the waters. And keep in mind, a mean high water line in some cases can go into the water. So if you show a shoreline, um, the, the mean high water elevation may actually be further out of the water or further into the land. So it is, uh, it is that shoreline is not necessarily what they can um, use to uh, calculate your setbacks to. Absolutely. And um, I thank you so much, Regina, for being on here and sharing um, your bits of wisdom throughout the presentation. Um, I know I highly recommend it. And guys, um, as a title company, we have our connections locally throughout the community. We try to make these connections so that, or not try, we have these connections so that we can ask questions like this. And, you know, I had called Regina to ask her the question and she was so gracious enough to come on here and, um, you know, share her wisdom in this um, bit of time. So we are very thankful for Regina and her taking the time every day yeah. um, to really just make sure that you guys are getting the proper answers to things. But again, it is about working as a team at the end of the day. And thank you, Kathy from Old Republic Title, our underwriter for being here and um, doing this class with us. Again, my name is Lucy McGuire with Aero Title Services, and uh, we are we are doing a lot of we've been doing a lot of these classes. All the classes are located on our YouTube channel, Aero Title Services. So, guys, make sure to go check those out. Um, I will also be sending out an email with um, the replay for this for any of you guys who wanted to recap on this. So, um, I hope that you guys have an amazing day. And really quick, actually, I want to do a um, quick little raffle. I saw a few people drop off, so they lose out. But um, I have to drop off Lucy I have another meeting so thank you everybody thank and you. Lucy I'll send the I'll send you the presentation thank you Gina and David thank you so much oh, thank you 
Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. And thank you to everyone who is here. One second. Look, I'm a government surveyor. Regina is in it and she's been doing it for a long time. And I can attest to that. She's, you know, does a wonderful job. So send her some business. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Dave. <laughs> corner, sur corner surveying, um, and we use them quite frequently. So we are very thankful for Regina. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. All right.